On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, we now know which versions of the Cybertruck will be built in the first year, courtesy of the U.S. government. Plus, Tesla pulls a demand lever they've never pulled before. The Highland Model 3 performance looks like it'll be getting a new name and or a speed boost and more. Greetings, friends. Ryan McCaffrey here with you alongside Daisy the Boxer, who is looking longingly out the window while sitting on the couch, and Zelina the Future Service Dog, who is laying at my feet next to me. This is Ride the Lightning, your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast for October 29th, 2023, episode 430. Well, I'll get right to it because I have some really fun stuff to talk about this week. Let's dive right in. First up, the craziest story of them all this week. It's crazy, but it's true. Remember the Cybertruck unveiling four years ago when Elon talked about the Cybertruck being really tough and not fake tough? Here's a reminder of where I'm going from that night four years ago. You want a truck that's really tough, not fake tough? <laughs> A truck can take a sledgehammer to, a truck that won't scratch, doesn't dent. What else can we do with this truck? What if we, what if we shot it? Let's, let's, let's shoot it. Got OSHA, I mean, come on. <laughs> so the, the that's a nine millimeter bullet shot at the door. Shoot it. <laughs> We're in California, unfortunately. <laughs> but the nine millimeter, it's, it is it is literally bulletproof to a nine millimeter uh, handgun. That's how strong the skin is. So it's, it's, it's ultra-hard, cold-rolled uh, stainless steel alloy that we've developed. We're going to be using the same alloy in, in the Starship rocket and in the Cybertruck. So while they didn't actually shoot it on stage four years ago, they instead played a video of when they actually did behind the scenes, they did shoot up a real Cybertruck this past week. And I'm not talking about one or two bullets from a 9mm handgun. They emptied 74 rounds into the side of a release candidate Cybertruck, and yes, someone counted, credit to my friend Bearded Tesla Guy for that one, for going out and actually counting it in the images. Photos and video were taken of the truck as it was out cruising around the San Francisco Bay Area roads in the following days. Sadly, at least for the moment, we'll see about November 30th at the delivery event, we don't have any actual imagery or better yet, video of the truck actively being shot at, but they're still driving the truck around, which by the way, is the most Tesla thing ever. So it's like a double layer of the most Tesla thing ever because no other car company would shoot up their own vehicle for testing purposes slash amusement. But then on top of that, let's say another car company was willing to do that. They wouldn't then, they would destroy the vehicle immediately afterwards. They'd be like, well, this is, we can never show this anywhere. We got the data we wanted. Just crush it, get rid of it. But no, Tesla takes it right back out on public streets and just parades it around. Like there's, here's a cyber truck rolling around the freeways with, with not bullet holes, bullet dents in the side of it. Because, and I say bullet dents and not bullet holes. Because Elon Musk did confirm this on X, the artist formerly known as Twitter, responding to one of the posts showing the bullet-riddled Cybertruck, saying, quote, We emptied the entire drum magazine of a Tommy gun into the driver door Al Capone style. No bullets penetrated into the passenger compartment. Now, 
In fairness, we don't know how far away they shot from or what caliber rounds they used, but regardless, this is both ridiculous in the very best of ways and also kind of amazing. I think Tesla's going to see a surge of reservations from drug cartels now. No, I'm I'm kidding. Although, am I? I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not actually kidding. But that really was the wildest and funniest story of the week. And I absolutely wanted to start the podcast with it. But we're not done talking Cybertruck yet. Speaking of the upcoming stainless steel truck... We now have as close to official confirmation as we can possibly get that the Tri-Motor Cybertruck will be offered at some point during the first year of production. The evidence for this comes via, as I said at the very top, the U.S. government. It comes from the new 2024 model year VIN decoder that Tesla gave to NHTSA, which is now available to the public on the NHTSA government website. I downloaded the PDF. Page three is the Cybertruck and Tesla Semi VIN decoder page. And it's uh, it has this information in it. Digits one through three are the world manufacturing identifier. Digit four is the make, line, and series with T standing for Tesla Semi and C in the VIN standing for Cybertruck. Digit five, the chassis slash cab type. B standing for day cab, obviously applying to the Tesla Semi. E standing for truck dash LHD, hold that thought. Digit six, the gross vehicle weight rating, where you have the E signifying class eight, that's of course semi truck, meaning over 33,000 pounds. G signifying 8,000 to 9,000 pounds, which would seem to suggest the dual motor perhaps and H signifying class H, 9,000 to 10,000 pounds. Digit seven, the fuel type will be E for electric on all of them. Digit eight, here's where, here's the information that you really want. Digit eight, the motor drive unit braking system designated for the semi is letter B for the dual drive rear axle with air brakes and D and E. So D standing for dual motor standard designated for Cybertruck, E standing for triple motor performance, designated for Cybertruck. And it kind of goes on from there. It's the rest of it's not really important. So first up, side note, perhaps some optimism for those of you listening with Cybertruck reservations in Australia, New Zealand, and other right-hand drive territories. You heard me say it, digit five, E specifies truck dash LHD left-hand drive suggesting that maybe there could be a right-hand drive designation at some point. If there is, it's definitely not happening in the 2024 model year though. That seems to be pretty certain. Now let's get back to the biggest piece of news out of this VIN decoder. Digit eight for that motor drive unit braking system, E standing for triple motor performance in the vehicle identification number of the Cybertruck. So this almost certainly means that Tesla intends to produce tri-motor Cybertrucks at some point during the first year of production. Now, there won't be any 2023 model year Cybertrucks. We know this because the one auctioned off at the Peterson Auto Museum, which, again, they absolutely worked with Tesla on, was advertised as a 2024 Cybertruck. Plus, November, specifically the beginning of November, is when Tesla typically switches over to the new model year anyway, and the Cybertruck delivery event isn't until the very end of November. So we can't say with certainty that the tri-motor is going to be there from day one. It could get added to the production line six months into production, nine months, 10 months, 11 months. But there's also just as good of a chance that it will indeed be a day one choice for the lucky folks who get to take delivery in these first few months. Here's hoping that it will indeed be a day one choice available on the menu. I decided to make this 
the Patreon poll for this week. Again, you don't have to be a Patreon backer to vote in the poll each week. It's open to everybody, open to the public. Just go to my Patreon page. Usually every Tuesday night is typically when the poll goes up. And my Patreon page can be found at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And the poll question this week was simply dual motor Cybertruck or tri-motor Cybertruck? Because we know now as well with this VIN decoder, the single motor, the $40,000 version that was advertised at the reveal night, definitely not getting made during the first year of production, if ever, but it's definitely not happening in the first year. And we also now know that the quad motor is not a thing, at least for the first year of production. So, uh, of the poll respondents, of which there were plenty, 34% of you voted, my decision will be made primarily on the price of each trim, with 21% of you saying, my decision will be made primarily on the range of each trim, 16% of you said, I'm definitely going for the dual motor. Another 16% of you said, I'm definitely going for the tri-motor. And 8% of you saying it's too early to decide. 3% saying I'll hold out for quad motor and hope it gets made later. 2% of you saying I'll hold out for single motor and hope that it gets made later. So uh, good stuff from all of you voting in the Patreon poll this past week. And again, we're getting so close now. I mean, as you hear this, we are basically one month away from the official launch of the Cybertruck. The countdown is now officially on. Moving away from Cybertruck and onto some other Tesla subjects, another quick bite to start the show off. Another week here, another price change there. This time, it's just one vehicle getting a price adjustment and one trim of that one vehicle. Specifically, it's the Model X Plaid. It has gone up by $5,000 to now having a base price of $95,000. Do remember, though, because I was just having a chat with a very wonderful Patreon backer about this. Uh, This person's trying to make a decision about a Model X. The awesome... Six-seater is the only thing you can get with a Plaid. They are not building five-seat Model X Plaids or seven-seaters. And the six-seat option by itself is, uh, I believe, $5,500. I actually don't have it in front of me. I think it's $5,500. So you can only get the Plaid X in that six-seat. So, you know, that that kind of factors in a little bit. It it's maybe doesn't make the price increase hurt quite so much because you're still getting that $5,500 option baked in. But nevertheless, any price increase on any Tesla is never fun to report on. I don't sit here going, yay, the Model X Plaid costs $5,000 more. Certainly not going to sit here and celebrate that. But what I can say is this is the first time that the Plaid S and Plaid X haven't been the same price for quite a while now. And it also puts a bit more separation between the Long Range X and the Plaid X. It's now a $15,000 difference between the two, although again, a reminder that the base price of the Long Range X is for the five-seater, not the six-seater. So it's really like a $9,500 gap if you're comparing six-seat to six-seat. So, which kind of makes me think, well, Before this $5,000 price increase, it was kind of a good deal, relatively speaking, for the Plaid X. But anyway, $15,000 gap now in the base prices of the Long Range and the Plaid, which is the same as the $15,000 difference between the Long Range S and the Plaid S. And that is probably why I suspect that Tesla made this change, to have that same sort of buffer that same pricing gap between long range and plaid on both the S and the X. I will say optimistically though, we continue now to have not a single Tesla with a six-figure base MSRP. And what's what's nice is 
that's a, a fairly new phenomenon in the entire history. Well, yeah, the entire history of the company since it started producing Roadsters in 2008. It, it's very, very rare in the overall history of the company for there, for there to not be a single vehicle with a base MSRP of one of at least $100,000. It's been the case for most of the company's history, but they all start under 100000 as of now. And I guess, I guess hopefully that will last until the next-gen Roadster finally comes out. If, uh, hopefully, if it, if it doesn't last that long, that means the, the Plaid S and or X have gone back up in price. Or it means the Cybertruck tri-motor performance is going to be more expensive than we thought it was. So we'll see about that. Uh, one more interesting wrinkle for Q4, which is, of course, the quarter that we're in now. So last quarter, as many of you will, well, all of you will recall, and a number of you took advantage of, Tesla finally gave us what we've been asking for, and they allowed us to do a one-time FSD transfer to a new vehicle. This quarter, or at least the remaining two-thirds of it, we get for, again, I believe the first time ever, I don't recall this ever happening, the ability to transfer your free lifetime supercharging, if you have it, to either a new S, new X, or new Model Y. Not a Model 3, though. So Tesla says, current Tesla owners with active free supercharging are eligible to transfer their supercharging to their new Tesla vehicle when they order a Model S, Model X, or Model Y. Customers must take delivery of their new Model S, Model X, or Model Y by December 31st, 2023. Note, owners must notify Tesla of their intent to transfer supercharging and sign the relevant documentation prior to taking delivery of their new vehicle. The transferred supercharging will remain on the vehicle for as long as you own the vehicle. Emphasis mine on that. So they're saying if you sell it to a friend, to a, you know, if you just sell it privately, that Tesla can take it off. And it sounds like they probably will once the car is no longer in your name. Obviously, if you were to trade it into Tesla at some point, they, of course, will take that free lifetime supercharging off, which they've done to other cars that have been traded in to them. So this move here is, is quite obviously targeted at longtime S and X owners. And I know there are plenty of you out there. Since for quite a while, every Model S and Model X had free lifetime supercharging on them up until, and I had to, I had to look this up to double check my memory on it, 2018, that's when it stopped. But so from 2012, in the case of the Model S, up to 2018, and for the X, 2015 to 2018, every single one sold had free lifetime supercharging on it. And this move really seems to be laser targeted at those people trying to get them to, up, to upgrade to presumably a new S or new X. Although, you know, Tesla, including the Y in there, to me really says they really want to move vehicles this quarter, which we know they do because they're trying to have the biggest quarter in their history and hit their 1.8 million delivery uh, target for the year of 2023. So they're offering the Model Y up. Their most popular vehicle is part of this as well. However, I got the email myself because there are a very, very small handful of performance Model 3s, which was, it was really, it was the very first batch produced. Uh, not Well, not just the first batch, because the first batch of performance 3s ever made was, was the batch I was in. Red exterior, white interior, with the performance upgrade package, meaning the 20-inch sport wheels, the... Uh, larger red brake calipers and the carbon fiber spoiler, although that didn't get added till later. Anyway, the point is, it was really the first three or four months of the performance Model 3s all had free lifetime supercharging on them. I still remember it so well. I had configured my car in late May of 2018, and I knew 
All right, I knew what I'm getting. I knew what the price is. It, I was just waiting for it to be built and delivered, and I didn't quite know when that was going to be. And then I, a Tesla announced, hey, if you buy a Performance Model 3, it'll have free lifetime supercharging. So I got grandfathered into that before my car was even ever delivered, which was just such a sweet, totally unexpected bonus that absolutely made my day that day. And I have continued to enjoy that. But anyway, um, transferring, I would say, your free lifetime supercharging might not have the same monetary value as transferring FSD because I don't think you could reasonably value free lifetime supercharging at $12,000. Even if you could technically rack up more than $12,000 of free supercharging, but what I will say is the free lifetime supercharging perk does have a very powerful psychological pull on many owners who are blessed to have it. And I get it because I feel it. I'm talking about myself here. It just really does feel awesome knowing that I can drive my Tesla anywhere and never have to pay a dime at any supercharger ever. Like, it's a, it's a pretty cool psychological safety-like blanket. It's like a comfort blanket. Even if it's not, you know, financially necessarily worth a ton of money. I don't, like I said, I don't think it's worth $12,000, really, for, at least not for most people. But the one other powerful psychological plus about this perk is that you can't buy it. You can buy FSD, obviously, for $12,000, but free lifetime supercharging is a rather small club that is only getting, it's only gotten smaller over the years as people that had those older S's and X's have traded them in and then Tesla removes the free lifetime supercharging from them when they, when they sell that car uh, as a used car. So uh, it, is, it is a cool perk in terms of the psychology of it and also the the rarity of it, I guess. So if you are out there the, as an owner of an older S or X that has free lifetime supercharging, this I'm be, I'd be curious if this pushes you over the edge. Like, it does this demand lever move the needle for you? Feel free to email me, teslapodcast at gmail.com. Feel free to call in. I'll give you the call-in instructions later in the show. But I would genuinely love to hear from you if this is something that that you are intending, that you weren't previously intending to purchase a new Tesla, but this puts you, pushes you over the edge and now you're going to do it. You've got to take delivery by December 31st. It's impossible to say whether or not when December rolls around, if Tesla will revise that and say, well, you just have to order it by the 31st and you don't actually have to take delivery by the 31st, which is what they ended up doing for the FSD transfer. We'll see if that ends up happening at the end of the quarter here. But uh, by the way, uh, if you're curious, because I was and I looked into this and I'll tell you more about that in a second. Uh, I Because if, if I were going to do this and I did, I have given it some serious thought. I would not be wanting, I would not want to trade in my Model 3. We'd keep the three that would become my wife's car and I would get a Plaid Model S. And fortunately, Tesla did clarify in the small print that you do not have to trade in the old car. You can keep your car and still transfer that free lifetime supercharging off of it. You can just move it over to that new one. So on that note... I hope all of you who are very generously backing my efforts here with this podcast on my Patreon page found at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. If you're backing me at that $10 per month tier or higher, I very much hope that you enjoyed this week's lightning round bonus mini episode. I do these every single week on Patreon for Patreon. And the topic this week was my very very first world dilemma. Do we replace my wife's car with a Cybertruck or do we take advantage of this unexpected ability to transfer lifetime supercharging? Do we do, do we grab a Plaid S instead and 
and then just have a Plaid S with lifetime supercharging on it, which would be pretty sweet because I've called my Model 3 a unicorn before because it's one of a very, very few number of Model 3s in the grand scheme of things that has free lifetime supercharging. Well, a Model S Plaid with free lifetime supercharging would also be a unicorn because yes, there will be some of you that take advantage of this, this quarter, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to be very many cars. Like it's going to be a very small group of S's, X's and Model Y's as well that are going to have free lifetime supercharging on them. And again, a quick reminder, if you want to, if you don't want to do the monthly pledge, but you do want to support the podcast, you can do the one time, well, one per year annual pledge. And if you do that, you'll get a 10% discount versus the month to month option. So that's available. And Patreon does have a free seven day trial for specifically that $10 per month tier. So if you'd like to just try it out, give it a go, see what what supporting the podcast on Patreon is like, you can do that again at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And I apologize, I just accidentally whacked my desk with the microphone on it with my hand. So if there was a little knock on the microphone, that's my bad. All right, let's get to the rest of the Tesla news this week. It gets more fun here. It seems that the Highland Model 3 performance that we know is in the works might be getting quicker or at the very least might be getting a cooler name than Model 3 performance. This comes from an update to the official Model 3 parts catalog, which was spotted by the Kilowatts on X before Tesla realized the mistake and took it down. So what was there before they took it down? Well, first was a diagram of the back end of the Highland Model 3 with parts identified on the diagrams for the dual motor badge, which obviously is not new. We, many of us have that on our cars now. And then there was a part number and a little illustration for a square logo badge that upon closer inspection appears to be not a plaid flag. I, l- I like to call the plaid, the logo on the back of a plaid a flag because it's, it's flag shaped. So it's the plaid flag. Anyway, it's not plaid, but it appears to be ludicrous because it's just, you know, if you watch Spaceballs, it's bef- when they go to ludicrous before it goes to plaid, when it's just kind of that hyperspace effect that's very similar to the Star Wars effect that they are mocking throughout the entire movie before it, it the joke advances to the plaid. So uh, Tesla appears to be ready to put ludicrous flags on the back of the Highland Model 3 performance. So what else can we learn from this? Well, this suggests that the Highland performance will stick with two motors rather than go to three by virtue of being, you know, ludicrous instead of plaid. And that hypothesis is backed up by, call back to earlier on the show, the aforementioned 2024 Tesla VIN decoder that was posted on the NHTSA website, which on the SX3 and Y page does show a tri-motor designation as part of the VIN designation. But specifically, the tri-motor is only available on the S and the X. The Model 3 only has a dual motor VIN letter designation. So again, even if they're going to call it ludicrous now and put a ludicrous flag on the back of the car, this isn't necessarily an acceleration boost. The car does 3.1 seconds to 60 now, but hopefully it is. Maybe down to say, like, if I'm being realistic, 2.8 seconds, zero to 60. I mean, you know, that's quote unquote only three tenths of a second from where it is now. But when you're already down at 3.1 seconds, taking three tenths off is making it about 10% quicker. 2.8 is is actually a a pretty big difference from 3.1 in the acceleration department. So uh, we shall see, but either way, 
I do like, if, if indeed this, my hypothesis on the badging proves true, I do like that Tesla is switching to these, if you know, you know, flags on the back of their performance models. I mean, they're basically screenshots from Spaceballs slapped on the back of the cars. And I love that. That is just super fun, if you ask me. Now, corroborating that hypothesis about all, you know, all this talk of a performance of a, of a quicker, potentially quicker Model 3 ludicrous, corroborating that hypothesis is something else from the parts catalog that the kilowatts posted up. So, new 20-inch wheels. And design-wise, they are a slightly refreshed version of the zero-G wheel design that I have on my car now. In fact, by slightly refreshed, I'm talking just about the color because uh, as far as their form goes, in, in the parts catalog sketch or diagram, they look exactly the same as the existing zero-G wheels, except they indicate a two-tone color with a dark gray or black outer rim, and then the spokes are silver. Now, you might hear that and go, well, wait a second, that doesn't corroborate anything, Ryan. What are you talking about? It's just wheels. Here's the corroborating part. So, because a new wheel design, as I said, is, is certainly no indication that it's quicker to 60 than the outgoing Model 3, what is is that there are two separate part numbers for the same zero-G wheel image, which strongly suggests that the wheels are different widths, meaning a staggered setup on the new Highland Performance Model 3, meaning a wider tire in the back. And that alone could potentially squeeze another tenth of a second or two out of the performance on the same battery, same drivetrain, but that you know that part of it remains to be seen but it's uh there's there's some corroborating evidence here if you ask me now another note by the way on the new model 3 the highland i do want to say congratulations to any of my international listeners who've taken delivery of one of the first highland model 3s they are officially as of this week officially out in the world now in the public's hands so it's going to be really fun to hear everybody's thoughts, everybody's opinions, everybody's impressions of this new refreshed car. And it also means that the clock is ticking on its arrival here on Tesla's home turf in the U.S. We just don't know quite how much sand is in that hourglass just yet. I mean, it'll most likely arrive here sometime in Q1, but when in Q1 is anybody's guess. Oh, and I forgot one more thing that I did want to mention for you. Some new findings, courtesy of our white hat hacker friend, Green the Only, who does his thing by, by digging down into the, the source code of, uh, of the Tesla software. And he has made some more interesting findings. First up, in relation to the performance Model 3 Highland that I was just talking about, he says, the refreshed Model 3 will come in two flavors, base and sport. The sport version will have different front seats with bolstered side support and headrest. The Refresh 3 will have different rear bench seat, i.e. the middle seat will have a headrest. So looks like another change for the Performance Highland or the Model 3 Ludicrous as it may end up being known. We shall see. I hope so. I hope they call it that. I hope it's not Model 3 Sport. I hope it's Model 3 Ludicrous. That would be amazing. Um, but yeah, different seats, sportier seats that will hug you a little bit better for that sport, uh, sport driving. Love that. And then Green says, the Model S and X are getting the RGB ambient interior lighting, which is no surprise because they were supposed to get it a while ago, and Tesla didn't end up moving forward with it at the time, and now the the new Model 3 has it, the Cybertruck has it, it makes perfect sense that the S and X are going to be getting that as well. In fact, Green adds, he says, there are going to be two RGB lighting packages, 
RGB interior lighting and instrument panel RGB lighting plus regular premium lighting otherwise. He says both options would be present in Model 3 slash Y and Cybertruck. So that is some more interesting stuff. I've got a few more news stories to get to, but before I do that, let me take a quick pause here and shout out Accelerate Auto. This week's Ride the Lightning is brought to you in part by my old friends at Accelerate Auto who offer the excellent X-Care extended warranty coverage for your Tesla. You might be thinking, well, why do I need that now that Tesla's offering their own extended warranty? Well, I am glad you asked. For starters, as you've heard me say, Tesla's policy unfortunately offers no flexibility. It is a fixed two-year, 25,000-mile coverage plan. With X-Care, you can be a lot more flexible. You can go up to 10 years, up to 125,000 miles after your factory warranty is up. And not only that, they now offer something that their customers have been wanting for a while, battery and drivetrain coverage. You don't have to add it to your to your uh, plan, but you can. It is there if you want to do that to protect the most in- expensive repair, potentially piece. That was not a good sentence, but we're going to go with it. You know what I'm trying to say. So you can get the battery drivetrain protection as well. Uh, so check them out. Find out which X-Care plan might be right for you by going to accelerateauto.com slash xcare. That's X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E. And don't forget to use the discount code LIGHTNING for $100 off your purchase. All right, back to the news here. A new report says that Tesla will begin a Giga Berlin expansion in the first half of next year. I saw this on Tesla Rati, who writes, according to a report from the German publication RBB24, a Tesla spokesperson said the company hopes to perform factory expansions to the Brandenburg location starting in the first half of 2024. The expansions will begin with construction to modernize the existing facility and build a water recycling plant before initiating plans to add a second production facility and a battery recycling plant in the following years. Tesla submitted expansion plans to the government in July, revealing that it expects the second phase of construction to boost annual production capacity to 1 million vehicles per year. In addition to increasing vehicle production, the automaker also hopes to reach 100 gigawatt hours of annual battery production at the plant, which could become water intensive. And you know, this story, I I gravitated to it because we haven't really heard much about Giga Berlin lately. Even in the earnings call last week, or I guess more specifically, it was the shareholder letter, it basically said that Giga Berlin's just been humming along and we should expect the same production out of it that it's been doing in recent quarters. But of course, Tesla being Tesla, they are playing chess here, not checkers. They're always thinking several moves ahead. Giga Berlin, we know, is going to be a big factor in Tesla's future. With 4680 battery cell production happening there, which is going to supply European Model Ys in due time. And I suspect that the expansion, if not this round, since it doesn't specifically mention the vehicle production expansion in a concrete way, it just says, well, we're going to get to a million per year, but it just mentions modernization. Now, my interpretation of, the, of modernization is perhaps setting up to do gigacasted front and rear pieces for the Y to build structural battery pack cars with those 4680 battery cells made on site. So um, we shall see what happens. But I think this is almost certainly part of a master plan with this factory to pave the way for European production of the Generation 3 car. Remember, Tesla has said, Elon has said, that they aim to build three to five million generation three cars per year. So they're gonna need a number of factories all humming producing that car in order to achieve those numbers. And it would only make sense for Giga Berlin to be one of those facilities since it could supply the gen three cars to all of Europe. It just makes too much sense. 
next this week. In the completely unsurprising department, a new study says that Teslas are among the least stolen vehicles in the United States. I saw this on Inside EVs who writes, the Tesla Model 3 all-wheel drive and Model Y all-wheel drive are the least stolen vehicles in the United States. According to the Highway Loss Data Institute's latest insurance report that tracks thefts for passenger cars, pickups, SUVs, and vans from the 2020 to 2022 model years. The data has been collected from almost 40 insurance companies across the country, and the vehicles are ordered after the relative claim frequency score that's based on how many cars are insured versus how many thefts were filed. The Model X long range was the number five least stolen car in America, and the base Model 3, so yes, a second version, the Model 3 is on this list twice, the base Model 3 came in at number seven. The Model S long range just cracked the list as the 20th least stolen vehicle in the the US over the past couple of years. Again, remember, this is a good list. These are the least stolen vehicles. And it's certainly not surprising to any of us because a Tesla, as we all know, is very difficult to steal at all in the first place, thanks to the key cards and particularly the phone keys that all four Teslas use now, and soon soon the fifth one, the Cybertruck. And Teslas are virtually impossible to steal if you also choose to enable pin to drive, unless, say, you're physically threatened by the thief to punch in the code and then get out. You know, that's hopefully none of us ever find ourselves in that harrowing of a situation. But again, the point being pin to drive just adds another layer of, of extreme difficulty to stealing any Tesla. And really on that note, I would say if you're not already using pin to drive and you live somewhere where there's any threat at all of car theft happening, I recommend enabling it. I went ahead and did so. Mainly, I'm not not worried about my car being stolen, but for me, it's just extra peace of mind. So I, I turned it on for my car. And by the way, if you're curious about what the opposite list looks like, the most stolen vehicles in the US, here is that information once again from Inside EVs who writes, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the vehicles with the highest theft claim frequencies where the Dodge Charger SRT Hellcat, a V8 powered sedan, gets the top spot. Other cars that seem to tickle thieves fancy, their words not mine, are the Infiniti Q50, Dodge Challenger, Land Rover, Range Rover, and again, they're, they're saying rather surprisingly, the Kia Sportage as well. So... I just thought that was that was a fun counter. Not not that I'm saying it's I'm not rooting for cars to get stolen, but it's it's an interesting counterpoint to Tesla's being the least stolen. And finally, this week, one more story to talk to you about. Here's a first. Another company besides Tesla is paying to put up Tesla superchargers. I saw this one on Tesla Roddy, so one more tip of the cap to them. They write. Tesla has sold $100 million in supercharger hardware units to oil giant BP as it attempts to bolster its EV charging infrastructure. Tesla superchargers will be installed at various locations in the BP Pulse network, which are located at BP Amoco and Thornton's branded sites. Also, Travel Centers of America locations and at BP Pulse's large-scale GigaHub charging sites near airports and major metropolitan areas across the United States. The deal marks the first time ever that the hardware was ever purchased for an independent EV charging network. BP will begin rolling out the chargers in 2024, with the first sites being in Houston, Phoenix, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., The idea was to combine Tesla's fast and reliable chargers with BP Pulse's industry-leading intelligent charge management software called Omega for a comprehensive solution for for fleet customers. The fast chargers from Tesla will have an output of 250 kilowatts 
and based on appearance from BP's press release, will be the new V4 superchargers that have started being installed across the United States. They will be fitted with BP Pulse branding, and the company will install and operate the supercharger piles. They will also feature the Magic Dock, which enables the use of both NACS and CCS connectors, enabling multiple electric vehicle manufacturers to utilize the BP Pulse charging network. Richard Bartlett, global CEO of BP Pulse, commented on the deal saying, quote, Strengthening the BP Pulse network with Tesla's industry-leading hardware is a major step forward in our, in our ambitions for high-speed, open access charging infrastructure in the U.S. and advances our ambition to delivering an exceptional customer experience. Combined with our vast network of convenience and mobility sites on and off the highway, this collaboration with Tesla will bring fast and reliable charging to EV drivers when and where they need it, end quote. Well, I'll tell you what, if Tesla wasn't making money off superchargers, which they are, they definitely are now. And I'm going to defer to Tesla's VP of Investor Relations, Martin Viecha, who commented on this on X, because I really think he said it best. Martin said, quote, this is a big deal. ICE car drivers will get to see fast chargers wherever they refuel at BP owned stations, which is great for the EV transition. On top of that, more fast chargers for EV owners. It's such a win win. Well, well said, Martin. Uh, also, listener Sean Bloom from New York emailed me with a link to this and wondered will they honor free supercharging? Of course, the we were talking about that earlier in the podcast. Unfortunately, I would have to guess that the answer to that is probably not, especially when they say that their charge management software, Omega, is what's going to run this. So it's not going to be Tesla software. It's not going to be you know directly part of the Tesla supercharger network. So I suspect that those lucky enough to have that free lifetime supercharging on their car are going to have to pay at these superchargers. But as always with these kinds of things, I'd be happy to be wrong. It is a legitimate question though, and we'll have to wait for official confirmation either way before we know for sure. All right, that is everything I've got for you in the busy world of Tesla news, but stick with me. I've got plenty of your Ride the Lightning hotline phone calls teed up and ready to go right after this. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. Welcome to the Ride the Lightning hotline, your chance to call in and potentially be featured here on Ride the Lightning. I invite you to do so. I welcome you to do so. There are two easy ways to call in. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question. Please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible. And then email that file to me at my podcast email address, which is teslapodcast at gmail.com. Or you can take that same 90 second or less question and just call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. The toll-free number that you can dial anytime, day or night, 24-7 is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they are special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. We kick off this week with Quentin from Ohio talking Tesla Semi. Hey, Ryan, it's Quinn from Ohio. What is popping? Thanks again for the podcast. Love listening. Hey, I was just listening to your podcast episode from last week talking about the Tesla Semi, and I wanted to say there's an article from Motor One from 2017 talking about the zero to 60 time for the Tesla Semi when it's unloaded being 5.0 seconds, which I think is nuts. For context, I drive a Model 3 Standard Range Plus that does zero to 60 and 5.3. I couldn't imagine driving something the size of a house that can accelerate that quickly. Also, I just wanted to throw this out there to the Teslaverse for a feature request. And that is, I was wondering if we could have the preconditioning option from Tesla 
to be a little more segmented. Instead of just having it available for weekdays or all week or weekends, I was wondering if they could break it down by day. And here's why I ask. My wife, for example, has a job where she's expected in the office a couple of days every week. Not all five weekdays. It's just a couple of days, obviously new since the pandemic. And it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to remember to switch it on for a couple of days and then leave yourself a reminder to switch it off. I think it'd be really cool if Tesla could let you select the individual days of the week that you're preconditioning your car in the morning before you leave for work. At any rate, that's the call. Thanks for the podcast. Have a good time. First of all, Quentin, excellent feature request here. I suspect you and your wife are far from the only household who would benefit from more delineation in the preconditioning features of the car. Here's hoping that Tesla considers that for the near future, particularly as chillier temperatures are now starting to set in around most of the country here as we are full on into the fall season. And thanks for calling out the Tesla Semi's 0 to 60 number. I tried to find a few sources to see if there was an updated number since, as you mentioned, the article that you found was from just after the reveal way back in 2017. And from what I could find, it doesn't look like Tesla's given an official final zero to 60 figure for it. But since it's using a plaid drivetrain, it probably is still quicker than the Model Y standard range, even being, as you so perfectly summed it up, the size of a house. Thank you very much for your call. Doug in Pueblo, Colorado is up next. Hey Ryan, Doug in uh, Pueblo, Colorado. Just uh, have kind of a frustrating mechanical issue that I was hoping you or one of your listeners knew something about. I've got a 2018 Model 3. I love everything about the car except for the frameless windows. It gets a little bit cold and uh, the driver's side windows lock up. They won't go down. You open up the door and close it and they're banging against the frame. It's not a new issue. I think it first happened about seven months after I purchased the vehicle. And uh, happens every winter when it starts cooling off. Happened this morning. It wasn't even freezing. It was 38 degrees, but happened anyway. I've had it into the shop like three or four times now, and they basically tell me there's nothing they can do about it. But uh, it's going to be... A long winter dealing with that um, so like I said if anybody in the ride the lightning community has any thoughts on how to keep that from happening it it does seem to be like a controller issue or electronic issue because it doesn't happen on the passenger side uh, side but on the left side both where it, both the driver door and the passenger door, it happens and it happens to both in unison. So anyway, love the show. Talk to you later. Thanks. I would like to try and crowdsource this one because I am coming up a little empty here. So do any of my cold weather based listeners out there have any good suggestions for Doug? If anybody can help him out and educate me in the process as a bonus, I think we would both be grateful. You can call in, you can email in, whatever you want to do. Uh, it'd be great to try and help Doug out. And for me, learn something in the process. Next caller is Mark from near Vancouver. Hi, Ryan. It's Mark calling from near Vancouver. I haven't called in in a while. Um, my, my grandfather uh, is 84 years old, has a Tesla Model 3 and loves it. Uh, I also have a Model 3. But I often have to check his settings and what he's done kind of when I'm you know, in, in week to week or, you know, month to month when I see him. And I, I thought came to me as a suggestion to the software team. So I, I think there should be an overall setting, an easy button, setting A, setting B, setting C, or something similar where uh, a global type of button will do the most popular setting. So, for example, um, you know, the collision warning, the, um, you know, whether it's at medium, uh, automated high beams, um, sentry mode when you're at home, whatever the most common setting is for most people 
uh, have that as an A button. It's kind of a default. Uh, B might be something else labeled, and C might be something else. Uh, but the idea is for people to have to individually go through when they're not that familiar or not that good at it, I think sometimes it's difficult uh, to follow along. So uh, some iteration of that I think could be useful, uh, just a thought. Uh, Ryan, thanks for what you do. Uh, you make my drives entertaining, and I appreciate it. Uh, give the dogs a good pet for me. Okay, cheers. Bye. Hi, Mark. Thank you for the kind words, and it's great to hear from you. I like this suggestion. Tesla has all of this data, so why not put it to good use on behalf of owners? It could also be useful for new owners, too, who might want a place to start in the car that, that takes away the potential initial anxiety or potential sense of being overwhelmed due to the paradigm shift that these cars bring for most people. We speak your suggestion into the ether here in the hopes that the Tesla software team might hear it and consider it. Take care, Mark. Thanks again for your call. I've just got time for one more caller this week, and it's going to go to Corey in Minneapolis. Hello, Ryan. This is Corey from Minneapolis, Minnesota. First time caller, but long time listener, not only of your Tesla stuff, but also the stuff that you do over at IGN. So thank you and keep up the good work. Hey, I just wanted to give a shout out to an underrated device, and that is the standard 118 volt mobile charger. Um, my wife and I recently purchased a 2023 Model Y, and we absolutely love it. We we're going to upgrade our garage, but honestly, I've been using just that standard charger into the basic outlet of my garage, and I've been getting about 60 to 70 miles uh, a night, which is plenty for my next day. So I know that charger gets kind of a bad rap, but it's truly the little charger that, that could it if you don't do a lot of driving. Um, we've been getting a lot of use, and we have not had to upgrade our garage so far. Also, just a bonus note, not only is this a fantastic car, um, excuse me, fantastic car, but my favorite thing is giving rides to quote-unquote deniers that do not believe in the tech or the car, and then finding out that it's actually uh, very efficient and fantastic, and that's been my favorite bonus thing is showing people that don't believe in the tech um, that it's truly a great car and them walking away being very impressed. So thank you, Ryan. Keep up the good work. Corey, welcome to the hotline and thank you for the call. I love that you have an open-minded attitude and are willing to give doubters a ride in your car. That's big of you to do and it sounds like you, well, you and the car have, uh, have changed some minds with that. So that's awesome. Now, as for the mobile connector, I'm glad it's working out for you. It is a real bummer that Tesla stopped including them with every car. But even having to buy one, it is still less than half the price of a wall connector. So hey, if that gets the job done for you, it's definitely worth mentioning for others to consider as they are making that decision depending on the use case for their car. So thanks again, Corey. Take care. Appreciate your call. Thanks to everybody who kindly took the time to call in. I will get to more of your phone calls on next week's podcast, so feel free to keep your calls coming. I gave you the call-in instructions at the top of this segment. But I'm not done yet. There's still a bit more Ride the Lightning to go, so stay tuned. Be right back after this. I got my cyber beer and my cyber steins in the mail and got to test it out for the first time. I have not opened the cyber beer yet. That I've got one in the fridge, one still in the just in the case in the box. But the cyber stein I did make use of with my favorite beer tonight. Uh, we had burritos, so it was, a, it was a nice pairing, if I if I may. And I have to say, uh, it when I looked at it. I was like, this Stein doesn't seem like it's going to hold that much fluid. But the the uh, Mother Earth Nitro Cali Cream and Beer that I like, it comes in 16-ounce cans. And it fit right to the tippy top with the... So that, that actually it held more liquid than I thought it would. And I enjoyed it. It was fun to drink beer out of. So that was nice. Hey, how about an entertainment recommendation how about my Arizona Diamondbacks in the World Series? Their improbable run continues. They won the National League pennant by uh, defying all odds and beating the Philadelphia Phillies in Philadelphia twice in games six and seven 
to advance to the World Series for the first time in literally half my life. They've made it once before in 2001, which if you're a baseball fan, you may remember as one of the greatest World Series ever played. Seven games, Diamondbacks won it in the bottom of the ninth off of Mariano Rivera, the greatest closer to ever live, and we beat him. Well, to, as I record this on late Friday night, the Diamondbacks closer in 2023, definitely not the greatest closer ever. He's no Mariano Rivera. He hadn't given up a run all postseason, but what did he do? He gave up a game-tying two-run home run in the ninth. D-backs were up 5-3 to three in the ninth, blew it, went to extra innings, and then lost it on a home run in the bottom of the 11th. So uh, I'm a little heartbroken right now. For all I know, that could be the first of a one crushing defeat and then they just get swept or maybe they galvanize and they come back and they win the series. I don't know. But what I do know is I've loved baseball my whole life. Uh, I love the Diamondbacks. I've been a fan since literally day one when the expansion franchise was awarded to Arizona in 1995. I was fully on board. I bought a hat that I wore for three years before they ever took the field. I went to the first ever game in 1998, the first regular season game. I went to the I went to the World Series game one that year, which the Diamondbacks beat the Yankees. And I, I love baseball. I love the Diamondbacks. So this has just been an insane ride for me to watch them inexplicably make it to the World Series. So I... Uh, made bad financial decisions, bought World Series tickets for games three and four, which are the first two games that are going to be in Arizona. We'll see if game five, which would also be in Arizona, is even necessary. Hopefully it will be at this rate, because if it's if it's not, that means the Diamondbacks got swept. But I'm going down. uh, My mom's birthday is on Monday. So uh, and, and that's the day of game three. So I'm taking, I bought tickets for the two of us. I'm taking her to game three. And then my uncle Tony, who is the, the, the person in the family primarily responsible for nurturing my affinity for baseball as a kid, he's a lifelong and, and also mostly long suffering New York Mets fan, but certainly, you know, pulling for the D backs here and when when the Phillies series started, he said, well, if the Diamondbacks make it, why don't we go out to Arizona and, and catch a game? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. So they made it. And so we are we're going to meet up and uh, he and I are going to go to game four. So, you know, win or lose these memories, you know, it's a chance to, to have some great sports memories with family The if you know anything about Arizona pro sports, you know that they never win and they barely ever even make it to the, whatever the championship game is in each professional sport. So just going to try and savor this. I'm hoping the diamondbacks have it in them to win the series. I mean, they should have won game one. They had it. So they definitely can beat the Rangers. I hope they will. But anyway, I am flying down to Phoenix today as this episode releases, I'm heading down on Sunday, game one on Monday or game three on, on Monday, game four, On Tuesday, I may have lost like three quarters of you by talking about baseball there, I realize. But uh, how about let me bring it back to Tesla before I wrap things up. How about a pro tip of the week? Hey, Ryan. Long time listener, first time caller. One of my friends had an issue that came up that I had never heard of, which I learned from and calling in to hopefully help some fellow listeners out there. He has a 2018 Model 3 and without warning, the brakes became sticky. In other words, after the car came to a stop, when the accelerator was depressed to move forward, the car initially wouldn't move, and only after depressing on the accelerator even more, it finally jerked forward as if she had her foot on the brake and launched the car. This happened every time the vehicle came to a stop and accelerated. The problem was so bad that she opted to drive her other vehicle to avoid the jerkiness that had been happening. She made an appointment through the app, and after bringing the car in, they notified her the following day that the issue had been resolved. They explained that if you rarely use the mechanical brakes, there's a buildup from the dust and other particulates, and over time, causes the issue of the brakes sticking. What they did was to burnish the brakes, basically driving the vehicle and braking fairly hard 
and repeating this process several times in order to remove that buildup. A way to prevent that is obviously to use the mechanical brakes every so often. However, if you find yourself with this issue, instead of, it, instead of taking it to the service center and paying $127 as she did, they told her that she could have just burnished the brakes herself. Hopefully someone finds this useful. Thanks. Take care. I'm going to count this as a pro tip, so thank you very much for calling in. I have heard this one before, but I think it's very much worth passing along because it is a uniquely EV problem. On the plus side, your brake pads in a Tesla or really any EV will last, for all intents and purposes, essentially forever. They will last a very, very, very long time, which is another, another you know, kind of unknown little perk about electric vehicles that I think most people don't know about. If anybody else out there has a good pro tip of the week that you'd like to share with me and your fellow Tesla owners and enthusiasts, please feel free to call in with it. You can call in the same way that you call in to the regular Ride the Lightning hotline. All right, before I go, I'll mention some friends of the podcast that can hopefully be of use to you. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe sometime down the road. I'll start with abstractocean.com. Head on over there. Take a look at their just massive roster of aftermarket accessories for all four Teslas. Click on whichever car you own, browse around, see what you like, pile it all into your online shopping cart. And then when you get to checkout, use the coupon code RTLPODCAST to get 15% off of your first order. Again, that coupon code RTLPODCAST, all one word, no spaces. Maybe you want to get a tempered glass screen protector that's custom fit for each of the Teslas. Maybe you want to get an uh, interior lighting kit of some kind to either brighten or change the color of and brighten the interior accent lighting. There's just all sorts of neat goodies on abstractocean.com. So take a look and see what you like. The Snap Plate and Snap Plate Plus, the latter of which being new, available for all four Teslas, 3, Y, X, and S. They're available at everyamp.com slash RTL, and there's now a coupon code as well, a discount. Use the coupon code RTL. So the Snap Plate and Snap Plate Plus are what I recommend if you're gonna put a front plate on your car either because you want to or you legally need to, don't use the one that Tesla gives you because that sticks to the front of your car with automotive tape. And if you ever try to take it off, ever want to take it off, you're gonna be left with a very residuey, icky mess that's just not gonna be not gonna be a great, a great thing to clean up uh, after it's been on there. So use the snap plate or the snap plate plus. It is a minimalist aesthetic that blends in really nicely with the front end of any of the Teslas. It's made from recycled plastics made in the USA with stainless steel reinforcements. The regular snap plate is safety optimized with breakaway features to sacrifice itself in a worst case scenario, like a parking accident or a car wash. The snap plate plus on the other hand is strength optimized with hardened features for maximum strength. Either one, whichever way you want to go, Grab yours again at everyamp.com slash RTL. Budgetsafesolar.com. Keep them on your short list of solar providers as you shop around to look for a solar installation for your home or business. Budget Safe Solar also now offers home battery storage as well, uh, including power walls. So check them out. You know, give them a look if... Tesla Solar doesn't work out for you for whatever reason, as it didn't for me. Head on over to budgetsafesolar.com. And if you do end up proceeding with an installation, please use the referral code RTL. Meanwhile, Immaculate Reflections, the awesome detailing talents of one Jeff McGovern and his team there. If you are in or going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, there's no nicer thing you could do for your car and thus yourself as well by taking your car to Immaculate Reflections. Maybe you want to get it ceramic coated so that you don't have to wax it for the next three to five years. Maybe you want to get it paint corrected, get that paint finish looking as good as it possibly can, even better than when it comes out of the factory. Maybe you want to do paint protection film on some or all of the car. Whatever it is, 
Immaculate Reflections can take great care of you and they'll do a great job as they did on my car. So head on over to irdetailing.com. And when you get in touch through irdetailing.com, mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener and there's a nice little discount waiting for you. PureTesla.com slash RTL. That's where to go to get a nice micro SD based dash cam and sentry mode kit. Of course, it plugs into your car via the same USB port that's built right into your car, but it does use micro SD as its format type, which is just much better suited to the constant reading and writing that the dash cam and sentry mode do. So uh, get yours again at puretesla.com slash RTL. $49 will get you the 128 gigabyte kit. $69 if you'd like to step up to the 256 gigabyte kit. Either is shipped free anywhere in the US, which is a nice little thing. But if you are uh, international, there'll just be a, a modest shipping fee for you. Works with Mac or PC. It's plug and play. You take it straight out of the package, plug it right into your car. Easy as that. Finally, my Patreon. I mentioned it near the top of the show, but this podcast is free each and every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific, as it has been for the last 400 and now 30 weeks. If at some point you say to yourself, you know what, man, I really like listening to Ride the Lightning every week. I get a lot of information out of it. I feel informed, hopefully even feel a little, a little entertained maybe from time to time as well. My hope is that you might consider a pledge on Patreon. Because that is how this podcast is able to continue. It's through your generosity, your support. So head on over to my Patreon page to learn more about all the different support tiers. That page again is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. The base level support tier is just five bucks a month. And in return for that five bucks a month, you will get early access to each week's podcast. If you step up to the most popular tier, which is the $10 per month tier, you'll get the early access to each episode and you'll get access to every past, present, and future one of the lightning round bonus mini episodes. And the one I was talking about this week that I did about my first world dilemma of that the uh, the transfer of free unlimited lifetime supercharging has gotten me thinking about, do I wait for a Cybertruck or do I go with a Plaid Model S that, can, that I can transfer my Model 3's free lifetime supercharging to? That ended up being a 30-minute lightning round. I, I probably went on a little too long, if I'm being honest with myself, but there's 69 of those now. Nice. 69 of them. That is a lot of lightning round bonus mini episodes. All of them can be yours if you join me today at the $10 per month tier or higher on patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. Most of you get the podcast via your favorite podcast service, whether or not you're backing me on Patreon. There's, of course, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. There's TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube Podcasts. If you do want to find me on YouTube, just search Ride the Lightning Tesla on YouTube. You should find my channel very easily. As I frequently say, there are really mostly no videos there, but... If you just want to listen that way, if it's convenient for you to listen with a with an open tab, an open browser tab on your desktop uh, through YouTube, go for it. I do have every single episode up there. If you need a referral code when you're buying a Tesla, use somebody's. It uh, doesn't certainly doesn't have to be mine, but if you just need one to get that two hundred and fifty dollar discount as well as the three free months of FSD. Just go to ts.la slash Ryan73014. Hit enter and you will be taken to the Tesla Design Studio with that referral link and those referral bonuses baked in. Place the order for your car, however you want to configure it, and you will get that $250 discount and those three free months of free supercharging. You can follow me on X or Instagram or both. DMC underscore Ryan is my handle on both of those. Same same username on both. As I mentioned earlier, you can email me anytime. The email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. 
And with that, I will say hello and thank you to the upper tier Patreon backers. I'll start with the grandfathered in plaid level supporters. Thank you very much for your continued support to George Cassiopo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peake, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, the Tesla owners East Bay Club, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Ish, not Elon Musk, Peter, and the Bear Boys of Colorado. Next, the Maximum Plaid tier. An extra big thanks goes out to Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from New York City, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Watley, Mark Eversole, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Derek Nessel wrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody, Joel Sapp, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Ken Epstein, Doug Carey, James Gregory, Adam Lavoy, contact one call center.com, Jason Chalukas, Travis Krenzel, Bruce Otterstein, Tom Behan, Josh Pennington, Matt Kalen, John from Cream Ridge, New Jersey, Sean Tisdale, Dustin Hart, and Michael Gallo. Finally, an extra, extra big thanks goes out to the most generous tier of all the folks that are backing me at the Roadster in Space tier. Thank you so much to Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacovetto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, Carol Weston, Robert from Near Philly, and Kristen Rumble. Thanks so much to everybody for taking the time to hang out with me, chat about all things Tesla. It's always fun. Never a dull moment on this podcast. As I, as I often say, I am grateful to get to do this. I am grateful to you for giving me the attention, giving me the time to, uh, to, to make this thing every single week. I do sincerely appreciate it. So as we count down one month to go till the Cybertruck launch, happy electric motoring, my friends, and I will see you back here next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.